You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Andrea Matranga of the New Economics School in Moscow. Andrea, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thank you very much. Uh, very glad you invited me. So our topic for today is the Neolithic Revolution. Andrea has a paper titled The Ant and the Grasshopper, Seasonality and the Invention of Agriculture. So let's start simple. Um, You know, what what was the Neolithic Revolution? Right. So the Neolithic Revolution is the name that's been given since the 1930s to the process in which humans transitioned from nomadic hunting and gathering to settled agriculture. And Neolithic means new stone, because when they started doing this, they also changed the type of uh, stone tools. So initially, they didn't know it was associated with agriculture. They just saw that, you know, their their culture had become a lot more complex. And uh, initially, people thought that this had happened only in the Fertile Crescent, so in the area of, let's say, uh, the mountains around Mesopotamia. Uh, And then eventually, people realized that this had actually happened about uh, at least seven times, uh, probably more, but at least seven times independently in various places around the world between about 12,000 and uh, 4,500 years ago. So uh, over a seven, uh, 8,000 year uh, period of time. So it, uh, it it was discovered independently many times, but really spread out over, over yes, exactly. thousands of year gap between the earliest and the latest. Exactly. Uh, so it's an right. 8,000 year gap. They're also very spread out geographically, which is why people uh, believe they're independent. So uh, the, the, the seven places are, the earliest one is Mesopotamia, uh, and then uh, North and South China. And then uh, Mexico, uh, Southern America, and then the last two are uh, Southern America and South America and the Andes, and then uh, the Sahel area of Africa and Eastern North America 4,500 years ago. So pretty much on every continent except Mm. uh, Australia. Uh, where it arrived. Uh, so it seems that in Australia, the people that arrived from um, from the rest of Oceania, they had agriculture and then somehow uh, they forgot. Uh, so apparently the, in the new environment, either they didn't need it or you know, the type of agriculture they, they had didn't really work so well. So by the time white people arrived, it seems that you know, if they had agriculture, it was a very low intensity type of agriculture. Right. One thing that's so interesting about this is, you know, even though it was developed uh, in many different places and 10,000 years ago sounds like a long time, humans spent about 200,000 years, you know, virtually identical to, to modern humans. You know, they, they had, uh, you know, our big brains and uh, opposable thumbs and everything that makes us uh, physically human. And yet, for 200,000 years, nobody settled down and became farmers. So, and of course, your paper is dealing with why they became farmers. So, um, do you you want to start with some of the alternative theories? Right. So, um, well, the first theory that that really came up was people just assumed that agriculture would be awesome. Because, you know, you're a hunter-gatherer. That means, you know, people assume that hunter-gatherers, you know, they're always hungry. They're always starving. And they never know where their next food or where their next meal is coming from. And therefore, as soon as you have agriculture, that must be amazing. Because when they think of a hunter-gatherer, they think of a modern farmer. And then you take away the farmer. And what's left? Basically, a beggar. Uh, Now, obviously, uh, so this was sort of the the earliest opinion was, well, this is going to be awesome. You know, the problem is they're not smart enough or they don't have the technology to do this. But as soon as they're going to have the technology, for sure, they're going to adopt this immediately. Uh, so that was sort of the baseline theory that was sort of in the back of everybody's mind. Well, even in, in Greek mythology, pretty much. And then the, the the first theory, the first time that this was sort of questioned was uh, during this famous Man the Hunter conference that I think was around 1960. And Marshall Salins, uh, he started questioning this viewpoint. And he was basically saying that actually, if you look at hunter-gatherers very often, they, they seem to eat better and they seem to be happier and they seem to work less than farmers. And one of the interesting things about the Neolithic Revolution is that pretty much everybody has projected their current politics 
into their explanation for it. So in that way, it's a little bit like the Roman, you know, the fall of the Roman Empire, where in the 1970s, people assumed it was because of mm-hmm. inflation. And then uh, today, people say it's because of immigration. And so, so sort of people project current events into the past. And they did this with the Neolithic Revolution as well. So if you look at the 1930s, the, the term was coined by a British anthropologist and archaeologist called Vera Gordon Child, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, I read these things more than I speak them. And he called it the Neolithic Revolution because he was a Marxist. For, so for him, the whole point was, you can do something for a very long time, and then you can change. So, you know, you can have monarchy for a very long time, and then you can adopt a different form of government, and humans can do this. Uh, and then in the 1960s, instead, people were saying, you know, like, you know, you can have a simpler way of life, you can have a cleaner way of life, you can have a way of life that's more uh, in, in tune. Uh, and then in the 1980s, uh, well, you have Jared Diamond, uh, basically, uh, he writes this paper called The Worst Mistake in the History of the Human Race. It's, it's, it's on Discover Magazine, so it's, it's not a peer-reviewed publication, but it, it's still a very interesting take. And what he basically said was, See, this is the problem with humans, right? That, you know, we think we know something. So we adopt agriculture because we have this brilliant idea. Uh, and then in general equilibrium, it turns out that this leads to runaway population growth. And then, you know, and, and when everything settles down, so we're actually worse off uh, than we were before. And the reason why this viewpoint had come about was because uh, there was this very interesting book published in 1984 by Cohen and Armalagos. It was a, a review book. And they found that actually the first farmers typically had much worse health than the last hunter-gatherers. So if you look at the last hunter-gatherers, you know, they're very tall. They tend to have good teeth. They tend to have very thick bones. There's a lot of markers that show that they were eating quite well. Uh, and then when you look at the first farmers instead, uh, in some places they lose 10 centimeters over a few centuries. And this is the same people. So, you know, it really is uh, a big difference in nutrition. Uh, and they also have more inv- evidence of anemia. Uh, they also have worse teeth and they also have more, um, uh, they have more joint diseases. So it seems that they were actually working more and eating less. And, you know, Diamond's explanation is, yes, you know, initially if things were great, but then population, uh, there's runaway population growth, and in general equilibrium, they're worse off. Uh, and so, again, this is sort of following the general environmental trend uh, of the 1980s. I'm writing my paper after a financial crisis, so I'm going to talk about uh, volatility and, you know, shocks to consumption. So, again, I'm, I'm putting myself within this uh, group of people. I, I think I have some interesting evidence, but, you know, it's still the inspiration is, I guess, uh, somehow related to current events. Yeah. Well, how about um, how about you do a quick aside to explain the title of your paper? There's there's the uh, the story of the, the sort of fable of the ant and the grasshopper. H- how does that map? Well, what what is that fable and how does it map to hunter-gatherers versus farmers? Right. So the fable is originally from Aesop, uh, and then there's a modern version by La Fontaine, uh, a Frenchman. And what the story is, is that there are, um, uh, well, there's variants, but you know the, the, the baseline is that there's an ant and a grasshopper. And uh, during the summer, the grasshopper is uh, singing all the time while the ant is working. And, you know, the grasshopper, you know, it's summer, so it's very easy, you can eat easily, uh, while the ant is storing away the food. And the grasshopper is sort of making fun of the ant for doing this. And then uh, come winter, uh, obviously it's, uh, you know, very cold and there's not enough food and the ant is eating uh, the, the seeds from its larder, uh, while instead uh, the, the, the grasshopper is starving. Now, in the original version, the ant basically doesn't care. Then there's sort of like disney version for the children's book today in which, you know, the grasshopper gets less let into the ant, uh, ant hill and, but gets given a very stern talking to. So the basic idea is of showing that if you have seasonality, you know, you can get you know, through it, but you need to store food. And this is you know, sort of how it maps to it. Because what my theory is for why these seven different groups decided to adopt agriculture around the same time is that you know, the, agric- the Neolithic is basically a bundle good uh, in the sense, a bundle of technologies, in the sense that it's sedentarism and agriculture. So you, you're no longer nomadic. And on top of that, you start doing farming. 
So the problem is there's a very strong chicken and egg problem between these two uh, adaptations. Because if you don't know how to farm, then why would you become sedentary? Uh, it's better to you know keep moving around because that way if there's, say, a fire and a certain area is damaged, you can move to another place and get the food there. Uh, on the other hand, if, you d if you're not settled, then how can you really learn how to farm? Because you know farming requires you to stay in the same place year round. Because if you plant something uh, and then you leave, then you know maybe some animal eats it or somebody else comes and steals your harvest, uh, and, and you don't even know what happened. You just come back and your plants are no longer there. And this problem uh, was solved by an anthropologist called Testart. And you know when I found that paper, I sort of you know completely realigned everything I thought I was doing with this paper. And what he was saying was that the reason why you would become sedentary, even if you don't know how to farm, is because you want to store food. Mm. And the reason you want to store food is because you live in a highly seasonal environment uh, where food is very abundant for part of the year and is completely or very, you know, very difficult to obtain for part of the year. So one of the examples he gives is actually in, in your neck of the woods, because in uh, the Pacific Northwest, uh, there were these uh, tribes of Native Americans that lived off of salmon runs. And so the salmons, they all come in the fall and they're incredibly abundant and they would trap them and, you know, that was great. But the problem is then there was very little food comparatively during the rest of the year. But they became sedentary. They learned how to smoke them and they were able to survive off of this during the, for, for the rest of the year. Obviously integrated with other food sources, but this was sort of their staple food. And the interesting thing is, even though they don't have agriculture, they have these long houses, they have complex material cultures, they have uh, multiple levels of sort of so social certification. So they have everything else that we usually associate with moderately complex, um, you know, village agriculture without having the agriculture. Why? Because they had a reason to become sedentary and they could start accumulating stuff. Because if you're a nomad... And, you know, graduate students who've been hopping around from one program to another can familiarize themselves with this. Then you never really have more stuff than you can carry. That's, I mean, and, you know, with, with us, you know, we, we, we tend to move once a year uh, at most, so we can have some stuff. But it's clear that you're not going to have, you know, a lot of personal possessions if you're moving every couple of weeks. So this was sort of the, 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 the inspiration, one of the main inspirations for this project. And what my idea was, well, why would they all decide to become sedentary at the same point? And then I started uh, reading about the, basically the, the polyclimatic history of Earth. And it turns out that 12,000 years ago, which is when this whole process started, uh, there was a big spike in climate seasonality. And the reason for this is that seasonality is mainly due to the inclination of Earth's orbit. And uh, this changes through time. In 12,000 years, this was at a maximum, and this means that there was more seasonal climate than at any point, uh, at least in the previous 60,000 years, and actually, you know, to be you know, strict about it, in the last, uh, I believe it was 120,000 years. So there was this exceptional increase in climate seasonality, and because of this, the worst affected populations decided to become sedentary, and once they were sedentary, uh, well, their opportunity cost to engaging in agriculture becomes very, very low. And at this point, you're going to start seeing some of them start trying it. And because these are large populations that are, I mean, it's, it's several, it's the entire area that is subject to these conditions, they're then going to domesticate plants. And then because there's economies of scope, you know, you only need one guy uh, to come up with a better variety or a better technique, and then it gets diffused. And then there's very rapid there's very rapid uh, progress in this. And the interesting thing is that this can explain why when you have the initial transition from nomadic hunting and gathering to sedentary agriculture, it can explain why people become shorter. So it, first of all, it explains why they have less food, which is that they abandon some food sources that they could only access by being nom nomads. Now they're going to have to stay in one place, and this clearly strictly reduces the amount of food they can access. And the second thing is, why do they accept this? Because it used to be that they had more food, but there were some periods of the year in which they could hardly have any. Well, now they have less food on average, 
uh, but it's more evenly spread throughout the throughout the year. So it's not the worst mistake in the history of the human race. They just bought insur- insurance effectively. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like uh, the causal arrow you're drawing is from seasonality or food constraints at certain times of the year. So if there's a particular point in the year where a hunter-gatherer would likely starve because it's very hot and dry or cold and uh, icy, then it makes sense to store food. And if you're storing food, you you have to be sedentary. Uh, I can think of an alternative would be to have a herd of animals, in which case you could both store them, sort of keep them around and move around. But uh, if you're if you need to store it in the ground or in a building, yeah. then you need to be in one place. And then people figure out agriculture. What, what's the kind of time gap on that? Is it, does it come almost immediately? So, no. In fact, so the, the, the one... So first of all, I just wanted to uh, draw on something you said, because you mentioned this idea of storing on the hoof by having these uh, um, uh, herds of animals. And the problem with that is that the animals... It's a great way of transforming stuff you can't eat, like grass, into things you can eat, like milk and meat. But as a storage technology, it has the problem that these are mammals, so they have constant metabolic needs, uh, which means that you know if there's a drought or if there's a sickness or if you know there's a fire and there's no pasture, you can become you can go from being incredibly rich to incredibly poor very very fast because these animals they constantly need to eat. So the advantage of wheat is that it can stay there 12, 20 years. If you're in a dry place and you keep it dry and you keep the insects away and the rodents, it's, it doesn't require, it's not correlated with the rest of your food sources. Because you can be, uh, if you say like, I'm going to store by having these animals uh, so that I'm not so much dependent on my ecosystem. If there's a drought, the, system, you know, the rest of the ecosystem is going to die and the animals are also mm-hmm. going to die. So it's 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 sort of like a uh, it's an interesting way to transform grass into meat. It's not such a great way of controlling your uh, volatility. Sorry, that was sort of a, a, an important point. Now, so the idea is that the the one uh, case in which we really observe this well is that of the Middle East, uh, because it's been so excavated. Because you know everything has happened there, and uh, all of the three monotheistic religions, and you know, so there, there's a lot of excavations in in that area. And in that case, we see the Natufians, uh, and in the case of the Natufian, this is a population that we can see them descending or sort of evolving from the previous nomadic hunter gatherers, and then they become sedentary hunter gatherers. And there's good evidence that they are storing food. And then from sedentary hunter-gatherers, you then start seeing the first types of agriculture coming up with the pre-pottery Neolithic A and B. Uh, and this whole process probably takes two or 3,000 years. So it's, it's, it's not immediate. At, on the other hand, the problem with agriculture is that, you know, the archaeologists, they want to be very conservative with what they claim to be agriculture. Because if you, if you find, you know, the earliest type of agriculture in a certain place, that's basically out of tenure at you know, any any anthropology department in the world, pretty much, or archaeology department. So what they want to see before they claim this is actual agriculture is a domesticated seed. I mean, there, there's a couple of other things potentially, but what, what's really sort of the clincher is a domesticated seed. Because what domesticated means in this context is that it's a seed that would not be able to propagate on its own. So there has to be human intervention. Okay. So because they're so conservative, then we can safely assume that if an archaeologist says that there's agriculture in a certain place that's been developed, they must have been doing it for at least a few centuries. Like that's sort of really the bare minimum for somebody to go from, oh, let's try this out, to we've developed a type of seed that has never existed before and is now common. And on top of that, then they actually have to find it because, you know, probably the first guy that does it, you know, we're not going to find that. We're not going to be that lucky. So, you know, if you look at the dates, it's, it's probably two or 3,000 years in the archaeologist, but we can be pretty sure that it's going to be less than that. You know, whether it's half that or three quarters of that, that's sort of very difficult to say. And I mean, it's, it's impossible, really. It's just sort of what you think is, 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 is reasonable on the balance of probabilities. But there is definitely this lack. Right. So there's a transition process between 
being a hunter gatherer and a stationary hunter gatherer, and then eventually being like a true a true farmer. Exactly. And it takes a lot of generations of of cultivation to uh to actually change the crops such that they are, you know, ideally suited to humans. Things like wheat and corn in their modern forms. Absolutely. And when that happens, I mean I, I think from nomadic to sedentary, it's more of a bimodal transition. There's gonna be a little bit of in between, but really, you know, Either you're not accumulating, you know, a lot of tools and a lot of possessions and a lot of food and you're trying to be as mobile as possible, or you become sedentary and you start investing a lot into accumulating stuff. But I, I it's it's harder for me to visualize a guy who, you know, just moves every two years because you'd get none of the benefits of either pretty much. And unless you consider sort of Sweden agriculture where they they make sort of predictable uh, shorter hops. This is when, you know, what, what happens in places like Madagascar, where they burn part of the rainforest and then they cultivate on it for two years and then they burn the next patch. But this isn't, you know, sort of opportunistic response to, you know, shocks. It's just, you know, the predictable cycle of after you burn the rainforest, it's only fertile for two years and then you have to burn the next little patch, which is typically very close. But so so from from nomadic to sedentary, I think that was pretty much sort of a, a a more defined switch. But then going from this is wild food to this is wild food that I want to protect from grazing animals to this is wild food that I also uh, want to avoid you know erosion or you know whatever going on from it to this is wild food that I I, I pick parasites off of and remove weeds to actually you know, planting it and watering it, that is much more of a protracted process because there's things that we can't even really think of. We wouldn't consider it agriculture. It's just, you know, I, I don't step on it because I only have that. When I'm nomadic, I'm always in a different place, but now I only have that patch. So I'm going to be careful not to step on them if I don't need to. This is already something which is, you know, expending effort, which is going to increase the amount of food. So it might not be agriculture from a you know, agronomic perspective, but it is in terms of an economic perspective of I invest and I get more food out of this. So that's a very protective mm -hmm. process. So let's talk about your data and how you went about analyzing this. You are correlating two things, which is the volatility of the climate thousands of years ago in different parts of the world and the first, yeah. the, the invention of, uh, of farming or which I suppose would be the the discovery of er, the earliest permanent farming settlements by anthropologists and and such. But that's both of those are are things that kind of uh, that are so far in the past that I imagine it's it. I, I imagine other people have have been studying this for a long time. But where where do, where does that data come from? Right. So, well, the data on the adoption and the places, that's from a nature article uh, called Puruganan and Fuller. And, uh, well, they, the authors are called Puruganan and Fuller, and that's uh, late 2000, late aughts, I think. I, I can't really remember the date. And the problem I had here is that, you know, there's a lot of people that compile lists and people put different dates based on, you know, what the latest archaeological, you know, evidence was. And, you know, often they're only citing some of them or often they're only uh, focusing on one. Uh, so that was, you know, my, my baseline just because it was two authors. That was not me. So it wasn't me sort of cherry picking or, you know, being very careful, you know, having to be very careful to sort of not cherry pick. It was somebody else. So it's sort of nothing up my sleeve uh, numbers. And uh, this is sort of my data for the invention. Instead, the data for the climate comes from a project from the University of Madison. So when I started this project, there was no data, but then I sort of kept that long enough that eventually somebody produced the data that I needed. And this was uh, produced in the context of uh, global warming research. So because of global warming, people are now more interested in what the climate was like 20,000 years ago, because they want to sort of know how, how rare is it that temperature increases as fast as we've seen over the last 60 years. So what that data is, is, is 22,000 years of weather data, which has been simulated starting from 
uh, the actual uh, boundary conditions. So where the you know the the, the parameters for Earth's orbit, the chemistry of the atmosphere, where the global ice sheets are, which seas are in contact. Uh, because you know, diff- you know, with sea level changes, you know, certain seas were not like, for example, you know, the Arctic Sea. There was a land bridge between Russia and uh, the U.S., much to the horror of you know generals of both sides, I'm sure. <laughs> but so different seas were not in, in, in. So using all of these sort of boundary conditions, it then simulates a full uh, climate model for all of Earth, including, you know, the oceans, various layers, and the atmosphere, various layers, and mountains, and everything else. And uh, then they compare, he compares this to uh, the actual data we have for, you know, the sea temperatures and the, the core, the ice cores from Greenland and from um, from Antarctica. And he shows that it's, it's, it's quite close, considering, you know, the difficulty of this. And this is my data. So what I have is panel climate data uh, at 3.75 degrees squares for the last 22,000 years. And then I, I accumulate these in 44 periods of 500 years. So I aggregate them uh, that way. And so this is my uh, dependent variable. And what I'm basically showing is that temperature, mean, and precipitation, which is sort of the, the, the baseline is, is that after the end of the ice age, this is why they, they could start farming. I show that actually it doesn't have uh, quite a, it doesn't have that large of an effect, and in, in fact, it reverses sign depending on which controls are used. While temperature seasonality and uh, precipitation seasonality they have a consistent effect in, in predicting that both people are going to invent agriculture originally, like independently, and also that. Uh, they're going to adopt agriculture so that what I do is, is, I think it's an interesting way of doing this, which is it's, it's basically a contagion model because I measure how long it takes a given place to adopt agriculture after their neighbors have already adopted it. So what it's basically doing is it's, it's looking how fast it takes to spread, but it's controlling for when agriculture gets to a particular area. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So to be clear, there are only seven instances of agriculture being invented from nothing, but there are many more inter- instances of people seeing their neighbors or people in neighboring regions doing agriculture and then eventually uh, adopting it themselves, copying others. Exactly, exactly. Because, you know, basically almost everybody uh, eventually adopted it except for uh, parts of. Well, basically, parts of Central Asia, where you know you have populations like the Mongols, that well, it depends if you want to consider uh, herding as agriculture or not. But they don't become sedentary. That's the, and then it takes a very long time to reach to Australia. But today, the populations that are nomadic hunter gatherers, they're really it's it's an incredibly small set of people. So it takes some time, and that's and that's actually what makes agriculture interesting. It's not so much the invention of it; it's the spread. Because if it had happened on seven hill sites around places around the world, and that's where it had stayed, then it would be no more interesting than, you know, a certain coastal population developing a particularly interesting type of uh, fish trap. What's interesting about agriculture is that it's a franchisable model Mm -hmm. because it's something, you know, you can have a population that develops it and then they take the seeds and they move to another place and they start doing it or, you know, the seeds move. And they trade them, and they give them to somebody else. And this, and if you, if we go back to that example I made of the population in the Pacific Northwest, they were entirely reliant. They became settled. They had this complex material culture, but they relied on salmon. And the problem is that salmon, part of their life cycle, happens in the Pacific, so they, they you cannot farm salmon. And uh, there was no way for these populations to start spreading. You know, the, the way that agriculture did, there was no way to take the salmon and, you know, start spreading south into California or moving over the Canadian Shield uh, and crossing over to the East Coast. They were completely bound to, the, to this one resource that, you know, they had completely mastered. Uh, the difference with farming is that, as I said, it's a franchisable model. You can do it in one place and then you can copy paste it all over the world, which is, in fact, exactly what's happened. Not only this, but actually when you take it to another place, the productivity tends to increase because you're, you're bringing the seed with you and you're leaving the weeds 
in the old field. Mm. And the reason for this is that uh, weeds very often they mimic uh, the plant so that they're the, the plant of the field that they par- parasitize so that they're hard to extirpate. And what their strategy is is to grow faster than the actual plant and then to disseminate their seeds into the field before the farmer can harvest the actual crop. So they're sort of they're not paying this price to the farmer for being propagated, which is that I let you eat, you know, 80% of, of, of my seeds so that you take the 20% and plant them. So what what the weed does is it has lower productivity, but it produces all of them before the date of the harvest so that they end up in the field. The interesting thing is that if you move to a new place, then you're going to have only seeds of the crop, which were harvested, and none of the seeds of the wheat. Mm -hmm. So as you're moving and as you're founding new colonies, you're also purifying the gene pool of uh, your crop. And you're also typically leaving behind all of the parasites because you, you know, you're, 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 you're putting a lot of care. Uh, so the, the insects that prey on wheat in, uh, on wild wheat in the Middle East, you know, they probably don't do that well in a German winter. So when you bring that crop to Germany and you figure out how to grow it in Germany, uh, you get better productivity because you've left behind a lot of the parasites that used to feast on, on part of your crop. So, so the, the, the importance of agriculture is that it's possible and actually it rewards you if you bring it to some other place. Otherwise, it would just be another interesting technical adaptation that some guy figured out on a hillside and then an archaeologist to dug up uh, a long time later. Okay. So agriculture as a technology is, in a sense, super portable. It's it not only stays as good as it was before when you move it somewhere else it it gets better it gets more productive yes in this in this initial path of uh, especially in this initial process of distribution it, it really helps you purify the gene pool because it gets rid of all these weedy varieties and part of the parasites and i think this is a very important dynamic in this absolutely and today, the interesting thing is that if you look at today at the sort of what are the seven crops that provide most of the food to humans, which are basically wheat, rice, potatoes, uh, sorry, wheat, rice, maize, potatoes, uh, sorghum, uh, millet, uh, these are effectively five of the earliest plants that were ever domesticated. So there is this, you know, because you started doing this and you have a head start in them, you know, perhaps there's some plant in Africa, which is a lot better, you know, if you'd spent 10,000 years, you know, trying to improve the technology you, you, you cultivate it with and the genes of it. But, you know, once these plants gain this head start, basically it never made sense for, for anybody to start uh, ex novo with a plant that had never been domesticated. I mean, obviously, there's like a couple hundred plants that have been domesticated, but these, you know, the other ones are basically for variety. These are the plants that really provide the bulk of, of the calories. I think, you know, between wheat, rice, and maize, it's easily more than 50% I, I don't rem- of the calories that humans consume. I don't remember the exact figure, but it's, it's somewhere in that range. Mm. Yeah, so it, it's extremely path-dependent if, if, uh, if some other plant had been cultivated uh, before the ones that before those particular ones, you know, if it, some other if the earliest uh, farmers had just picked something else to satisfy their their cravings or something, uh, we might have a very different food landscape. But given that, given that you spend thousands of years cultivating something and it just becomes so much better than all the alternatives, you you'd never uh, switch back to to something else. Absolutely. And actually, Darwin makes this point in, in the selection of plants under domestication. Uh, you know, he, he's sort of uh, ridiculing the people that say that, you know, Africa, that Southern Africa has not, you know, given us any plants that are useful. And, you know, he, he says, well, you know, nobody's really tried it because the plants that were already domesticated arrived there. And then why would anybody start fresh? Uh, and you could say the same thing when people say, oh, you know, horses are really easy to domesticate. Well, you know, we weren't there when the first guy, you know, mm-hmm. the first 6,000 guys broke their neck trying to ride a horse. So if you start today with zebras, then, you know, the zebras look completely, you know, unmanageable. But perhaps the, 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 the original wild progenitors of the horses 
perhaps were just as difficult. Or, you know, we developed some techniques that work for horses and don't work for zebras, but there could be other techniques that we could develop that would work for zebras and not horses. And if you think about wheat, so a lot of uh, Roman law and a lot of the law that relates to uh, agriculture is, is sort of in the West is designed around the cycle and the needs for wheat. And so it's it's really this is sort of my 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 criticism uh, my one criticism of uh, as as much as I borrow intellectually from Jared Diamond but this idea that the main reason for agriculture is the presence of large seeded grasses it's very difficult to make this claim because you know we started with the large seeded grasses which are plants that grow in very seasonal environments so you know, my idea is you, you are in a very seasonal environment you want to become sedentary uh you're going to store food and at some point you're going to start doing agriculture now what plants are you going to use you're going to use plants that tend to live in very seasonal places and are easy to store which are large seeded grasses uh, but my idea is if people that had a reason to become sedentary in a place with a lot of figs, then perhaps today there would be fig trees that are, you know, 200 meters tall and grow fruit and perfectly neat rows so that they're easy to mechanically harvest. I have no idea what that would look like, but it's very difficult today to say, yes, large seeded grasses, they're completely essential to sort of the development of civilization because that's the path we took. So of course it's going to look to us like that's, uh, essential. But in fact, if you think about, uh, well, millet agriculture in China, potato agriculture in South America, uh, sorghum in, uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, these are all um, either small seeded grasses or uh, tubers. So actually, it's, it's perfectly possible to have large civilizations that you know, do not need large seeded grasses. So that's sort of my other criticism. Of, of the large seeded grass theory. Yeah, it's too easy to look at what turned out to happen and sort of see that as destiny. But uh, yeah, it, so- it sounds like your story could have had anything become, uh, or, or could have had many different things become the main uh, staple crops of humanity. It's just that uh, based on the location where people had the most... Um, volatility in their climate and the most reason to settle down you know whatever plants were initially most available to them eventually became our our wheat and our rice and our our potatoes and maize exactly i mean i i mean even to me i mean i'm not saying like if if you look at wheat you know it looks like a fantastic plant to grow i mean it's a short uh i mean there's varieties of it that grow in a short uh, period of time. So there's a short growing season. It's very drought resistant. It stores incredibly well. Uh, it's quite hardy. It does well in disturbed environments, meaning like if, if there's a landslide or if there's uh, if, if humans cut down the forest or uh, sort of do any kind of work, it tends to favor the growth of wheat. So wheat is a fantastic plant to grow. I'm just sort of recognizing that it's it's probably what I would think, given that you know I, I come from a civilization that has used wheat as the main source of, and even more so as an Italian. Uh, you know, wheat was sort of probably 95, 90, yeah, I'm guessing it was 95% of the calories that my DNA has eaten in the last, you know, thousand years, for sure. It was mainly bread, pretty much, for all my ancestors. So I, I don't. I'm not saying it's a bad plant. I'm just saying we we don't know what the alternative would have been if we'd started with figs or any other sort of plant that you know we, today we can't really imagine being a staple. But if you give it ten thousand years of concentrated effort, yeah, you know why not? So how how does it uh, how does your paper get from these seasonality patterns ten thousand years ago um, to your your abstract says. Uh, uh, that they're among the major determinants of the present day global distribution of crop productivities, ethnic groups, cultural traditions, and political institutions. So take us forward to the present day. How, how does this uh, initial situation 10,000 years ago play out and, and bring us to uh, our current world? Right. So, so uh, what, what I'm referring to there is really uh, literature, which has you know sort of been published by other people. I, 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 I sort of this paper is really about trying to explain why it, it, this is sort of the motivation is why is this important. 
And so, for example, there's these uh, studies done by uh, Cavalli Sforza uh, on the linguistics of the Indo-European language. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's interesting, you know, that sort of came out later, I believe, is that basically from Bangladesh to Iceland, the word for, you know, the ML group, so Miller, a meal, uh, all of these things that have to do with, you know, grounding uh, wheat, it, it's always in, it always involves the ML group. And so this is sort of related to Proto-Indo-European, which people think if it wasn't the language of the earliest farmers, then it was the language of the people that took farming and sort of popularized it around the world. Sort of, you know, like sometimes, you know, Italians invent banking, but then, you know, the Dutch and the, the, the British really, really go to town with it. So people think that the Proto-Indo-European was the language of this group that sort of spread it out. And the interesting thing is that the words related to agriculture, uh, they spread further than the genes. So it's a little bit like computer is the word for computer in Italian. So even where, you know, it's, it's not that this population group moved in and replaced people, but the people took the words uh, from them effectively because, you know, they said, well, what is this? Well, you know, it's, it's or even millet, millet as well. It, it has the same sort of root. What is this? Well, it's millet. So, okay, we never saw it before. We're going to call it millet. And, you know, it, obviously it's going to be something completely different after 10,000 years, but this ML group has been conserved. So that's as far as the linguistics are, are, are concerned. And then uh, in terms of the politics, there's this paper by Pascali, Maishar, eh, Moav, and I can't remember if there's, if there's a fourth co-author, uh, but basically what they're showing is that plants that had this, uh, um, plants that were based on wheat or cereal crops, because cereal crops are easy to store and easy to transport, and they are gathered at the same time of the year, they're also easy to tax. So what they show is that it's related to state capacity. So if you compare this to plants like cassava, where they stay in the ground and the farmer you know, grows them, you know, pulls them up as he needs them throughout the year, it's a lot harder to tax that because you'd have to send a tax man, you know, once every, you know, <laughs> two weeks to sort of pick a couple of plants. Uh, and then it spoils very rapidly after it's taken out of the ground. So if you compare this to, you know, the tax man in a uh, cereal culture, well, you have to mill it. So you just put the tax man next to the water mill and, you know, he takes 10% of whatever is milled. And that's the tax. You just need one guy at the mill and, you know, all of the food has to pass through there. Marx makes this point uh, that uh, what he says is that, um, I never checked whether it's factual, but what he says is that the, the, the feudal system abolished or made it illegal to own a hand mill because made, that made it harder to tax. So basically what that's saying is that that goes to show that, you know, that the, the type of agriculture you have influences the type of state capacity and the type of civilization which is able to be sustained. Uh, and I find this, you know, completely compelling also because if you think about the great, you know, steppe empires with the nomads, you know, the Mongols, the Huns, these are only, these are groups that can only come together effectively if they're coming to steal from the farmers. Uh, because there's very low economies of scale. Uh, you have to move around, so it's very hard to tax. It's very hard to impose centralized authority because you don't know where anybody is. You have to look for them if, if you want them to do anything. Um, so, again, like just, you know, the type of agriculture, the types of animals, the types of crops that you can grow in different places or can't grow is going to have a very deciding influence on what's going to be um, the type of society that can be sustained there, even from a political and social aspect. But again, these are not things that I test directly. This is sort of in the introduction and the motivation. You know, I'm saying it's not just, it didn't happen 10,000 years ago and then, you know, forget about it. It's, it's something that has had, it's basically set the stage for, you know, all of subsequent human history. It's just that there's been so many different ways this has interacted that I can't really give you a clean IV because, you know, the same factor that would have been beneficial, you know, 6,000 years ago when the Egyptians were doing something perhaps was completely the opposite 4,000 years ago when somebody else was doing it. So it's not sort of a mapping one-to-one, -one, oh, you have this crop and that happens, but it's just very hard to uh, abstract from it completely and assume that this didn't have an effect.
Yeah, it's it's really neat to sort of try to trace the the long uh, memory of history and and see how you know the circumstances of a yeah. very long time ago can propagate forward into and you know through a chain of causation all the way to to the modern day and beyond. Do you have any closing thoughts? Any any central lesson that uh, that uh, listeners should take away from this whole literature? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, for me, one of the take home points that I just sort of realized, because you know, now I'm teaching development uh, economics here, and uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to move to uh, Chapman University this 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 summer, and we'll also teach development. But it's the fact that. In, in deciding to adopt agriculture, humans moved from high return but high risk strategy, which was you know nomadic hunting and gathering. They were tall, they were eating very well, and they moved to a low return and low risk strategy, which is you know rudimentary agriculture and staying in one place and just accepting that you're not going to eat a lot, but at least you're going to eat every day, pretty much. So. It just is, is, I think, a very powerful reminder of the fact that when you're that close to the subsistence limit, you know, people are going to be incredibly risk averse. Effectively, they have mini max utility. So I have become, it sort of influenced the way I look at some of these development interventions that want the farmers, if, if any, any of an intervention that, you know, requires of the subsistence farmers to take on more risk. And in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, well, you know, they had a high return, high risk strategy and they abandoned it for, you know, much lower returns as long as there was as little risk as possible. So, for example, I I would expect that, you know, micro insurance might be more important than micro credit because you cannot... You cannot ask them to take on risk, you know, by buying fertilizer that, you know, if if it doesn't rain, they're out the crop and out the fertilizer, uh, the cost of the fertilizer as well. They wouldn't have survived, you know, their their lineage would not have arrived today if it hadn't been that effectively every one of their ancestors for the last 6,000 years was incredibly risk averse. So I I think this is something that as uh, Westerners and settlers and people that have access to credit, we tend to think in terms of averages. You know, this is, you know, your average income and you don't care how much money you made you know, this week, because, you know, partly your, your, your employer typically smooths it out for you perfectly. Uh, but when you're that close to subsistence limit, you know, very, what, what to us would be very small bumps to them are mountains. This is sort of something that's, that's really sort of changed my way I look at this. All right. And on that note, my guest today has been Andrea Matronga. Andrea, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Thank you very much for having me. It was great. Discussion question for this week is agriculture, good idea or bad idea? So you can define uh, good and bad however you like, but do you think humanity would be better off had we not had the necessity of living in a more sedentary lifestyle if we had never encountered the problem of, uh, of seasonality, say we... So if things had remained as they were for the first 200,000 years of our evolution. If you want to answer that question and contribute to the discussion, you can join the Facebook group. That's Economics Detective on Facebook. There are a couple questions you need to answer. Any answers, fine, just uh, just for my knowledge. And, uh, and you can join the group and contribute to this and other discussions. Thank you, and I'll be back next week.